So sleep is a really common problem in the menopause transition. About 40 to 60% of women during the perimenopause and menopause will have difficulties with their sleep. The most common thing to experience is actually waking through the night, often many times. Sometimes women can wake very early in the morning and can't get back to sleep. And sometimes it's difficult to fall asleep at the beginning of the night. Even if you've always been a really good sleeper, menopause seems to be a time when the sleep can be disrupted almost out of the blue. And it can be quite an early symptom of the perimenopause. It's really important because having poor sleep does lead to other problems. So women will feel tired the next day, it will impact on their work, their relationships, and it can lead to other menopause symptoms becoming worse. So things like mood, anxiety, brain fog can all get worse with poor sleep. So during the perimenopause, there's lots of changes in hormone levels that can have a knock-on effect on sleep. So we see lower levels of progesterone and varying levels of estrogen, and these can all create a reduction in the quantity and the quality of sleep. Also, other menopause symptoms can have an effect. So if you are having hot flushes and night sweats, Commonly, this will wake women throughout the night, often feeling really hot, having drenching sweats, needing to change bed clothes, that type of thing. So that's really disruptive. Getting up to urinate throughout the night, which is more common in menopause, can also have an impact. If your mood is low during the menopause, or if you have perimenopausal anxiety, that can also have a knock-on effect, and it can tend to make sleep worse. Um, also, aging. So as we get older, our sleep naturally becomes poorer in quality and we sleep a bit less. And actually the natural timings of sleep shift to become a bit earlier. So you often find people want to go to bed a bit earlier and naturally wake a bit earlier as they age. All of this is really important because when sleep problems start in the menopause, they can often keep going for quite a long time. And that's where sometimes they can become insomnia. So if the sleep problems go on for more than three months and they're frequently happening, often we call that insomnia. Sleep apnea is a disorder where the upper airway can close off during the night and it kind of disrupts breathing, often only briefly, but enough to cause a little waking throughout the night. And this can often happen many times. Now, the rates of sleep apnea double after the menopause. So it's definitely something to think about. And if you are having really loud snoring or you're waking, gasping for breath, it's something to be considered. Also, it tends to make people feel very sleepy the next day. So if you find that you're falling asleep or feeling really sleepy at times you're not wanting to sleep, it's definitely worth considering if sleep apnea might be at play. There's another condition, restless leg syndrome, and that increases in frequency at the time of the menopause. It's where you have an urge to move your legs um, and it can be quite uncomfortable. Often it comes on in the evenings or when you go to bed at night and it can really disrupt sleep. Sometimes it's related to an iron deficiency. Normally, when we're thinking about understanding someone's sleep, we can do that by finding out about their experience and their history and just really listening to them. It can be really useful to do a sleep diary. And this is where for about seven days, you record when you go to bed, the time you fell asleep, any wakings throughout the night, and it can give lots of useful information about the amount of sleep that you're getting and also how broken it is. And it can kind of point to where the problem lies. Some people might um, need to have a sleep study or a polysomnogram, which is kind of an overnight test where they monitor your movement, your breathing, your brain activity. And that could be indicated if there's a suspicion of something like sleep apnea. Um, other than that, sometimes blood tests are useful looking for iron deficiency and other things like that. So even if you've always had really good sleep and then it becomes disrupted in the menopause, it is worth having a little look at your lifestyle to see if there are any tweaks that you can make. Caffeine is quite a powerful disruptor of sleep. So we'd always say check that you're not having any caffeine after about 12 midday because it can last in the system for quite some time. Also alcohol. Often people that are struggling with sleep find alcohol quite helpful, relaxing. It seems to kind of be quite sedating at the beginning of the night. But actually it does have quite a disruptive effect 
particularly on the rapid eye movement sleep in the second half of the night. So it will cause these little micro wakings that you might not be aware of, but then make you feel very tired and like you've had poor quality sleep. And actually it can help to cut down alcohol for lots of other menopause symptoms as well. So that's worth thinking about. Thinking about having a good regular routine is important, particularly for the waking time. So if your waking time shifts a lot, um, then we don't get the same messages to regulate sleep. So having a really regular routine can be really helpful. Also, some people find that having some time before they go to bed, just to wind down, move out of the stresses of the day, perhaps have dimmer lights, avoid screens, have a relaxing bath or shower, and just kind of make that segue into sleep that can be really helpful as well. Having said that, there are lots of things you can do that are healthy for sleep, and we should all be aware of them. But actually, on their own, they might not be enough to help if you've had an ongoing sleep problem and you might need some other treatment for that. So I think it's always worth considering, are you having menopause symptoms that are influencing your sleep? And think about treating those. So if you are having hot flushes and night sweats, it's worth considering whether HRT is worth a try. So if you can take HRT and you're open to that idea, it's very effective at helping sort out those hot flushes and night sweats. And that can have a knock-on effect on sleep. Vaginal estrogen, if you're getting up to urinate through the night, that can be really helpful as well. Even if you don't have those menopause sleep symptoms and sleep's your only symptom, HRT can be helpful. And if you're thinking about the type of HRT, if you still have a uterus, you're going to need a progestogen. And actually, micronized progesterone seems to be the best choice for sleep. It has a breakdown product that can be very relaxing and sleep promoting. So it tends to be the right, right choice if you, you are having sleep problems. Other than that, if you can't have HRT or you don't want to use that, or if your symptoms continue despite having HRT, it's worth thinking about the effective treatments for insomnia. So the first line treatment for insomnia is something called Cognitive Behavioural Therapy for Insomnia, or CBTI. Um, and this is something that is as effective as any sleep medication, but tends to have longer lasting effects. And we know it can be really helpful for women in the menopause. If you're having uh, mood changes and anxiety, it also can help with those, as can things like antidepressants and other talking therapies. So that can all be really useful for sleep. So CBTI is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy for Insomnia. And it's a really structured programme that usually lasts six to eight weeks. And you are supported through that to make changes to the timings and the type of behaviours that you have around sleep. Um, and it can be done one-to-one -one with a, a trained therapist, or it can be done using a book or in a group. So bearing in mind, thinking about all those sort of sleep habits um, we spoke about, they can all be really helpful, as can making sure you're doing good levels of exercise. So activity tends to be really good for sleep. So exercise, but also social connections, social activity, stimulation, they can all be really helpful for sleep. In addition to the treatments that we've talked about, some people will also find other medication useful and things like there are antidepressants that can be very good for sleep as well. So that's always worth considering.